got to know Pastor Robert Ferro from Calvary Tucson a number of years back uh, in, in kind of some really challenging circumstances, and our friendship was formed in, in that kind of a time. But he's become a super close friend of mine. If you were with us on Wednesday night, I told the story about uh, the pastor's conference there in Tucson where they gave me the passage on circumcision. So you can imagine how that was going to go. But I want to tell you another a super fun story about Robert. So one of the, you, know, you know how when friendships are forming, certain things happen that really make the friendship. And so I remember, you know, uh, you know I have dreadlocks in case you guys didn't notice. Uh, I remember one day Pastor Robert came on in. He's like, he's like, I'm like, man, you look great in a mohawk. That's what I said to him. He's like, well, I'll do it if you'll do it. <laughs> to which my response was, let's do it right now. Because I figured, I mean, like me having a mohawk would be kind of normal, but Pastor Robert having a mohawk, that would be epic. You know what I mean? And very quickly, Robert's face got really nervous. Like he was like, and I'm like, come on, you want to do it? And he got real kind of quiet. And then he ended up having to back out of it. And I've been giving him a hard time for it ever since, right? So, so it's been super fun. So just try and imagine Pastor Robert with a mohawk and you can see why I totally had to do that. So, but listen, so today my good friend, Pastor Robert Furrow is here. His, his bride, Kathy, is with him as well. And it was so beautiful this morning or yesterday, Lynn said, oh, I'm so excited that Pastor Robert Furrow is gonna be preaching. He's so good. And honestly, Pastor Robert is one of the best Bible teachers that I know. He's someone who I learn from all the time. So you guys know here at Crossroads, we love to appreciate the people of God. So let's all stand up to our feet. Let's give Pastor Robert Furrow, his bride Kathy, a huge round of applause. Love you. Well, I can't tell you how excited I am to be able to be here uh, with you guys today. And I just want, you know how sometimes our memories change a little bit over time. I just want to kind of give you guys, kind of straighten out how that whole Mohawk story started. It was really worse for me than what he had said because we're in the back room and he challenges me to get a mohawk. And I'm like, I'll talk. I'm like, yeah, Dan, I'll, I'll get a mohawk. So I walk out to introduce somebody else throughout the conference. I walk out to introduce somebody else and I say, uh, hey, listen, Daniel Fusco just challenged me to get a mohawk and I'm telling you, I'm ready to do it. I'll, I'll get a mohawk, all right? So I'm thinking there's no way the guy's gonna do it. I'm thinking, there's just, no, how long does it take to grow those things, man? I'm, I'm thinking there's no way. So then he comes out on, like, on, uh, to do his session, and he comes out and he says, I'm on, man. I'll do it right now. We'll, do it, we'll, do, we'll shave him right after. We'll do Mohawks right now. And, and I had to come out afterwards and go, okay, I officially back out. I'm, I'm, I'm not a man of my word. I'm not going to do the Mohawk. He wins. I can't do it. Because, you know, there's the same kind of thing. Daniel's going to look radical with a Mohawk, and I'm going to look like a complete and total and awesome dork. So... Let me, um, let me introduce you to my wife. Would you stand up, Kathy, please, for just a moment, embarrass you. This is my lovely wife, Kathy. This coming up April, we will have been married for three years, and uh, it's been a great three years, baby. Uh, Daniel talked about challenging situations when, when, you, when friendships are forged, and uh, five years ago, I lost my wife to uh, lung cancer, stage four lung cancer. And Daniel was one of those guys that came alongside of me during a very difficult time and said, you know, bro, I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'll, I'll be there. I'll take a red eye to your church. I'll teach for you anytime that you need it. And he did. I called on him to, to come during, you know, those difficult and hard last days. And uh, having friends like that, well, it's very important. And uh, your pastor is that kind of a guy. And I'm really blessed that he would have me come and share with you guys today because he thinks a whole lot of you guys. And he doesn't just entrust you guys to anyone. So I'm really, really humbled and blessed to be able to be here again and to share with you guys. I want to pray to start. Then I want just a couple of things to share with you. And then we're going to get into our study. Father, thank you for the time that we can spend here today. We pray now that your Holy Spirit would fall upon us. Each one of us. Fill us to overflow. That we would be empowered by you. That we would be strengthened by you. We approach this place today with a sense of anticipation, of expectation. You are going to move and we are ready to receive it. We believe that we receive from you what we're ready to receive from you and that if, we, if we're not ready, we're not gonna receive anything. 
And so by faith, we want to receive it. And we pray now that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher. We pray that you would bless this Bible study, the time that we can spend in the word. And we thank you for this. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. We have one of the one of the greatest passages in all of the pages of Scripture to be able to cover today. It is Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. I realize that Daniel is going through Joshua now. You're actually in the book of Joshua, right? Uh, and so are we. We're, we're kind of like tracking as churches through the same thing. When you guys were in Leviticus, we were in Leviticus. When you guys were in Numbers, we were in Numbers. And now we're, we're both in Joshua. Uh, this section of Joshua, though, it's... Uh, it, it, it's, 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 kind of, it's a passage that lends itself to great encouragement. I call it a, a, a motivational passage. It's one of those passages to fire you up for you to be able to say, I want to do all that God has for me, and I want to do what it is now. And I've given it a motivational speaker title. The title of the message today is Reaching Your Potential in Christ today. And I wanted to kind of be a motiv- like a motivational speaker today. You know, kind of take a little break from the pastor thing and be a motivational speaker. I was going to wear one of those Britney Spears face mics. You know what those, I, I don't know why motivational speakers wear them, but they do. The, or or for, that's for the younger kids in here or maybe middle aged with Britney Spears now, I don't know. Or the Garth Brooks mic for you older people. You remember that? Oh, Garth Brooks, it has, it's, 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 that, that kind of thing on. I also wanted to wear a really tight t-shirt, but I didn't know if Daniel would ever invite me back. So I decided to go ahead and, and, and bail out on and bail out on that. But, but I looked up motivational speakers, and you guys realize motivational speaking is one of those areas that is frothed with fraud. There are all kinds of people that do motivational speaking, and they just come up with their little their little gig, and you can make a lot of money if you do it good. And I, so I looked up motivational speakers just to see kind of what's out there, and I noticed that in their poses, they all do this. They do this right here. I have no idea what that really is, but you know, all their pictures, they're all looking like that. That looks motivating, doesn't it? Do you guys feel fired up now from that? Another thing that they'll do is they, they, they love interaction with the crowd. They love to get down and look into the crowd and look into the crowd's eyes, which is a good thing to do as a pastor too. I like to do it with my body. I like to do. It. I like to call out some of the people in my church by name. Just call call their name as I'm preaching. Say right so you right so and so right so and so. So here's what I want us to do. And you guys realize that the next service is going to do this too. All right. But what I want to know is I want to know: Are you ready to reach the potential that God has for you today? Yeah. All right, that's pretty good. I need to go over here because you guys weren't that good. Uh, you, these, this guy, this side was lots better. So are you ready to reach your potential in Christ today? Yeah. One more time because I'm have a feeling the next service is really going to outdo you guys if you don't really go to it, all right? Are you ready to meet your potential in Christ today? Yeah. yeah. Now, if we had one of those meters, that thing would have really fired up if that were the case. Well, since this is about potential, I, I, I want to start with a true story. There were three people who died and were standing before St. Peter at the pearly gates. Might not be a true story, but I thought I'd, <laughs> thought I'd throw that out there. And uh, remember, this is all about potential, right? And not everybody has the same potential. Uh, some people are gifted in great ways. Some people are great musicians. Some people are very athletic. Some people are, are talented and skilled and gifted in business. And there's all kinds of different levels. And I believe like the guys with the talents, God gives one, God gives five, God gives 10, that all God expects you to do is to do what God's laid on your, on your plate. You don't, gotta, you don't gotta run my race. I don't gotta run yours. I don't gotta run Daniel's. Daniel's doesn't have to run Greg Laurie's. Greg Laurie doesn't have to run Charles Wendall. We just gotta run our own race. I'm really glad about that, by the way. I don't want to be, I don't want to have to be a Charles Wendell. I would love to be Charles Wendell, okay? I'd love, he's one of my favorite teachers, but I don't got to run his race. That's a lot of pressure that's taken off me because I just got to run Robert Furrow's race. So these three, three guys, guys die and they, they, they go to heaven. And sure enough, it's kind of like a strange thing. St. Peter is there letting people in. And he says to the first guy, oh, by the way, I need, I need to set this up a little bit before that. Uh, how, how many of you guys here, here we are in Vancouver, and, and I, I really don't know the, the kind of whole layout of this place. There's a lot of animals around here, right? A lot of hunting going on here. How many of you guys are hunters? I need, some, I need you guys to be proud about what you do, by the way. 
How many of you guys are hunters? Raise your hand. Lift your hand up. You guys got there. I'm, I'm a hunter, okay? I haven't hunted in a little while, but I killed um, a bull, a good-sized bull with a bow. I started off with a rifle, went to muzzleloader, and then eventually ended up being an archery hunter. Did it for about 10 years. All right, anybody else? Raise your hand. Raise your hand high. I want to look around the room. All right, how many of you are avid anti-hunters? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Look at that. Okay, you're avid. Did you guys note the hands of the hunters that were raised? Can you get them after the service, huh? Can you track them down? Let them know. All right. So I told you guys that I'm just, and you know, the Bible says that a righteous man kills what he eats. And I've had a, a, a lot of nasty taste in javelina because a righteous man kills what he eats. <clears throat> All right, so, so the first guy walks up to St. Peter and, and, and Peter says, uh, what's your IQ? The guy says, well, I have 165 IQ. Peter said, 165? He goes, did you get your PhD? He said, well, yes, I did. He said, well, you met your potential. Enter into the joy of the Lord. The next guy walks up, he says, what's your IQ? He says, well, my IQ is 120. Peter says, well, 120, that's great. Did you get your master's? He said, I got a couple of them. Oh, well, then you met your potential. Enter into the joy of the Lord. The third guy, he said, what's your IQ? And the guy said, 70. And St. Peter said, did you get your deer? <laughs> and he said, he said, you met your potential. Enter into, the, enter into the, the joy of the Lord. Well, the truth is, we, when we talk about meeting our potential, we talk about doing what God's called us to do. We're just talking about what God has gifted you, empowered you, called you to do. And that's not a lot of heavy lifting. God has, has created you for what you were called for. God has gifted you for what you've been called for. Do you remember during the Old Testament times, the children of Israel were running around going, the burden of the Lord, the burden of the Lord, the burden of the Lord. You guys know any Christians always talk about how hard it is? So hard. It's so hard to be a Christian. It's so, I'm so tired. So hard. You know what God said to those, those Christians in the Old Testament, those believers in the Old Testament who were saying the burden of the Lord, the burden of the Lord? God said, stop saying the burden of the Lord because I haven't laid any burdens upon you. Think of Jesus, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We're not asking that you would do anything you can't handle. We're not asking that you can't do, don't do anything that you're not prepared for. All we're asking is that you don't bury your talent. All we're asking is on the day that he returns, we say, Lord, here's what you gave me with interest. Lord, I've done it. The guy with 10 talents doubled it up, had 20. The guy with five doubled it up, had 10. The guy with one buried it in the ground. He didn't give anything to him. So today we're talking about being used by God, having the call that God's given us, getting out, stepping out, and being moved and seeing God do things. Now, just a little bit about Joshua, because I think we need to, just a touch. Joshua was Moses' assistant, so Joshua, Joshua was considerably younger than Moses, and he took care of anything that Moses needed. A lot of times, a lot of people who do assistant work that might have a desire to be used by God can get a little bit bitter during those assistant days, but we don't see that happen with Joshua. In fact, we learn, and you guys remember the story? When, jo when Joshua was down on the battlefield fighting, I think it's the Amalekites, and they might be the Amorites or the Jebusites or the Gergesites or one of those guys. It's the Amalekites, I believe. And, and Moses has his hands raised up on the mountain. And when Moses' hands drop, then the battle goes towards the enemy. When Moses' hands are back up, the, the battle go to, goes towards Joshua. Joshua was faithful to fight in that battle, no matter what the intercession was taking place up on that mountain. That's a great study too, isn't it? That, that, that the battle isn't won on the battlefield. The battle is won in your devotional life. The battle is won in prayer. The battle is spiritual. And, and, and the, the physical goes one way or another connected to what's happening there. Uh, we're also told that Joshua would go to the, 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 the tent of meeting, a place that was set up for Moses to go meet with God before the tabernacle was built. And while I was in the tent of meeting, God spoke to Moses face to face as a man who spoke to a friend, and Moses' face would glow, and people would see him and be like, ah, and they'd, put a, he put a, uh, a, uh, uh, something over his face to be able to, to, so the glory wouldn't fade. They wouldn't see the glory of God fading. Well, the Bible says that God would leave, the pillar of cloud would leave, and Moses would leave, but Joshua stayed. 
Joshua had such a heart and a desire for God that he stayed where God was and where Moses had been. A heart to know God, a faithfulness on the battlefield. Of course, 40 years before this event, Joshua was chosen as a spy to go in and spy out the land. And he came out with a, with a good report. The others had that 10 were a bad report, but he came out with a good report. Yes, there are giants. Yes, there are fortified cities, he said, but our God will fight for us. Sounds like Romans 8. Who, who can stand against us? Our God's on our side. If God is for us, then who can stand against us? And so my first point in our study is that God works out the knots in the small stuff. We all got knots. I realize you don't. But the, the rest of us do. We all got things God's got to get out of our lives before he can use us the way that he wants to use us. And that's why it says, don't despise the days of small beginnings. You think God's gonna use you in a great way? You know what? When the disciples wanted to be great, he didn't discourage them. He simply said, learn to be a servant because the kingdom of God isn't lording over people. It's serving people. You'll be great when you learn to be a servant to all. And so God takes us through difficult, hard times, the, the small times. Don't despise those days. Just be faithful to do what God's calling you to do. The very first time that I ever taught, I was in a four-square church. I was in my early 20s, maybe even 19 years old. I taught a junior high class, and I absolutely loved it. I bailed out of the, the Sunday school material that they had. It wasn't very good Sunday school material. Whatever Sunday school material they give you, Sunday school teachers, don't bail out of it, okay? I'm sure it's fantastic. But I bailed out of it, and I had been listening to Pastor Chuck Smith, and so I went and I said, can I, can I teach through the book of Mark? And I'll never forget those kids getting so incredibly excited about hearing God's word. And on the day we left that church, on my last meeting with those junior high kids, there were tears in some of their eyes because God had touched them through the word. Don't despise this days of small beginnings. If anything, get even more faithful. Knuckle down, buckle down, and do it. Do it, do it, as Roger Miller would say. All right, that's another, that's another one for you older people there. People like young, younger kids, who's Roger Miller? Who's Roger Miller? It's king of the road, that's who he is. <laughs> older people get another chuckle, huh? All right, so, the, so, so our text starts off. It starts off in, chapter, in cha uh, chapter one, verse one. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise and go over this Jordan, you and all of the people, to the land of which I am giving them. What an incredible moment for them, right? This is the moment they're entering into the promised land. This is an amazing moment. They've been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. This promise had been given to Abraham when God said to Abraham, look up, Abraham, and look to the north and the south and the east and the west for all of this land I am giving to you and your descendants. And more importantly, that one who will come from your womb, uh, from your womb, Abraham, from your womb, one's gonna come. One who will come from your seed will bless all nations. The children of Israel, he goes on to say in verse three, and this is, this is important, every Place the sole of your foot will tread upon, I give you, as I said to Moses. What a promise. Every place you put your foot. The potential that they had, and I'm not gonna go over the map today because I don't wanna take the time to do it, but I just kinda wanna tell you a little bit about what's included in the land that he's gonna give them. He gives them borders. And the borders goes from the Great Sea, which is the Mediterranean Sea, all the way to the river Euphrates, which includes today, Jordan, today, Syria, today, Iraq, to the edge of Persia, which is Iran. What would be Lebanon all, and, and, and several countries that are above Israel today, all the way down into, into to Northern Africa. That's the potential that they had. They took less than 1% of what God had for them. Every place they put their foot, God gave them. What if God gave you that kind of a call today? What if he took you up on top of a mountain ridge today and said, every place you put your foot, I'm gonna give you. What would you do? 
That's an tr- incredible promise. Every place you put your foot, you'd be like, there, 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 there. Wait a minute. There. I wanted to be gentle with that guy. I don't want to break it. For our guys, I kicked that out of the way and stepped on it. But you'd be saying, I want everything. It reminds me of Elisha. When Elisha told the king, beat the ground with your arrows. And so the king took his arrows and he beat them three times on the ground. And Elisha said, why'd you only beat them three? God's gonna give you three victories now, but had you beat them on the ground many times, God would have given you many victories. Here's the key, folks. When God says, beat your arrows on the ground, you beat them on the ground. It's like Elisha and the widow go and borrow vessels. And she went and she borrowed vessels and he took the oil and the cruise and he filled up all of the other vessels until all of the vessels were full. Had she borrowed more vessels, she would have more oil. Had she borrowed less vessels, she would have less vessels. And I wonder how much land God's given us. I wonder how much God has for you to do. When I think of all of the incredible promises that we have been given in the word of God, are we receive God's promises in the walk. We receive God's promises in the walk where we put our feet. When God says to you, don't worry about what you're gonna eat, drink, or wear, but you seek first the kingdom of God and all of his righteousness, and all of these things will be added unto you. He promised he would take care of you. When the scriptures tell us that that you are filled with the Holy Spirit and you will be empowered to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth, that's God's promises to you. There are thousands of conditional promises in the scriptures. This is a conditional promise. What do I mean by conditional promise? If you do this, then I will do that. If you ask anything according to my name, I will give it to you. There's a condition there. It's according to the name of Jesus. In other words, somebody praying for heroin is gonna get it. Lord, I want heroin in your name. And Jesus is like, no, because it's not in his name. And people have tried to make that a blank check. I heard a sermon one time for that, out of that verse called the blank check. It ain't no blank check. Or if it has to be proper, it's not a blank check. <laughs> All right? It's conditional. And here's, here's my question, and, and here's my application. We walk around and gain territory when we do the conditions in the promises in God's word. And the more promises we know, the more conditions we understand, the more territory we take. I wonder how many of the ter- how much of the territory we have taken. I wonder if it's less than 10% of all that's been written in the pages of scripture. Maybe because we don't know. Maybe because we haven't taken time to walk the whole area. Maybe because we just haven't received, or maybe that we don't have enough faith that we believe him and say, you know what, Lord? You said, if I do this, I will do that. There's a little book that I used to use 20 years ago by David Wilkerson called the Jesus Pocket Promise Book. Anybody familiar with that? It's an awesome book. If you can find it, find it. We still carry it in our bookstore today. It's outdated, it like, looks a little weird, but it's full of promises that you can just take and read. Another thing I used to do when I would come across pro- uh, promises in my own Bible reading time, I would put a P by it, just in my Bible, a promise. You could put a CP, conditional promise. But there are also there are also unconditional promises. There are conditional promises, but there are unconditional promises where God also says, I'm just gonna do this for you. So the conditional promise was every place you put your foot, you're gonna receive. These people never, the whole nation of Israel, it, was the, it became the largest under David and it kind of started to fall back a little bit um, under Jeroboam and Rehoboam during that whole time. And so now the second non-conditional promise comes in verse three, or excuse me, verse five, where it says, no man shall be able to stand before you all of the days of your life. As I was with Moses, I will be with you. I will not leave you, nor will I forsake you. Did you note there's no condition? Simply, no man will be able to stand before you all of the days of your life. 
Everywhere you go, you will be able to defeat your enemies. And when I think of the non-conditional promises of the Bible, those are some of the most exciting promises that God has given us. And they're very similar promises. He said, I am with you wherever you go. No man will be able to stand before you. I'm with you wherever you go. And Jesus said, and lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. Why can you run your race? Why can you finish your race? And why can you finish your race good? Because Jesus is with you everywhere. He, he may have had God say to him this incredible promise, no man is gonna be able to stand before you, Joshua. And, and it might be a misapplication to take that and put it over to us. Well, no one's gonna be able to stand in front of us. Well, we're, but we're not Joshua. But, but Joshua didn't have Romans chapter eight. If God is for you, then who can be against you? Who can take you out of the hand of God? God is on our side. We've been given another great victory, the promise of victory. When Jesus was sitting with Peter in a place called Caesarea Philippi, there's a giant rock outcropping there. And he said to Peter, on this rock, I will build my church. There's some controversy about what rock he'd be gonna build it on. I'm gonna say the rock of Jesus, he would build his church. On this rock, you know, I'll build my church. But then he said this, two things. I give you the keys to the kingdom. That's like amazing. Some of you guys, your wife won't let you have the keys to the house. <laughs> and God's given you the keys to the kingdom of God. You have the keys. You can let people in. When people need to know, I, if people need to know how to go to heaven, you can let them in. Every once in a while, I like to make that statement to someone. I like to say, I have the keys to the kingdom. I can let you in. I don't know how you get there. I can let you in. You have the keys to the kingdom, Jesus said. But then he said this, and the gates of hell will not prevail against you. You know what that is? That's a promise, an unconditional promise. We are the church. And a lot of people like to badmouth the church. We are the church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against us, but the gates of hell are stationary. We're the ones with legs. You don't see gates with little legs chasing after people from the church. Ah, hell's coming after me. <laughs> Death and hell followed with it. But we charge the church. Excuse me, we charge the gates. We charge the church too. I mean, the church attacks each other. We devour each other. It's a horrible thing. But that's a whole other message. We, we attack the gates of hell. Before there was Jeremy Camp, there was a guy by the name of Steve Camp. Any of you guys remember Steve Camp? Raise your hand. We're talking back in the 80s now. We're talking back in, in the late 70s. They aren't related, by the way. But... Uh, Steve Camp had a song called Run to the Battle. The first line of the song was, some people want to live in the sound of chapel bells, but I want to run a mission a yard from the gate of hell. With everyone you meet, take them the gospel and bear it well. Look around you as you hesitate. Another soul just fell. Let's run to the battle. It was an awesome song. It was an encouraging song to say, look, we're in the battle. Another, another one of them was, do you have your armor on? You're in the middle of a raging war. We've been training for so long, but have you learned to use a sword? We may not be many, but we serve a mighty Lord. And what are you waiting for? Let's run to the battle. Let's run to the battle. We've been given a promise of victory. We've been given a promise that Satan will not be able to stand in front of us. And our battle isn't over property. Our battle isn't over land. Our battle is over the souls of men and women who are perishing, who their destiny is darkness, who, who James said, when you turn a sinner from the error of his ways, you're snatching a soul out of hell. And I believe that we change people's destiny by prayer and by preaching the gospel and that when we realize that we have that call on our lives, no one is gonna be able to stand before us. You're gonna be effective. You guys have friends, family, coworkers, and acquaintances who don't know Jesus. Love them, pray for them. Some of you guys are great at evangelism. 
Some of you guys are just, you're so good at it. Some of you guys, you really struggle. You really, I, I don't remember that. I remember, I remember being convicted at work. I needed to, to, to talk with a guy. And I remember talking to him and it's like that, those awkward starts to it, you know? It's kind of like, hey, I'd like to talk to you about Jesus. <laughs> and, you know, he, he loves you, he died for you. And it just, it, just, it just didn't go well. A few months later, he marched over into my area Tears in his eyes, he said, I just got told by my wife she's divorcing me. I put my hand on him, I prayed for him, and suddenly in the midst of his crisis, God touched his heart. God didn't touch his heart because I was super slick, because I was able to give him every answer he wanted. It was the exact opposite. But he knew I loved him, he knew I cared enough to share the truth with him, and in the midst of that crisis in his life, God was able to step in. We receive the promises of God as we walk them out. We're not, and this is an old Warren Wiersbe quote, all right? I'm not, I'm not taking this for myself. This is old Warren. And Warren Wiersbe was a great pastor, great, great book writer, all right? Here's an old Warren Wiersbe quote. We're not fighting for victory. We're not out there going, I hope I win, I hope I win, I hope I win. We're not fighting for victory. We're fighting from victory. We've already won. We, we've all, we're already in the fight. All we gotta do is do it. We just gotta fight, we just gotta get into it. You've already been given a promise of victory. What an incredible promise for Joshua. Just get into battle, no man's gonna be able to stand before you. We've already been told that the gates of hell will not prevail against us, and we've been given those kind of promises as well. The next one is in verse six. Be strong and of good courage, for you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to your fathers and give them. Now, now, I love this, and I, and I think about Joshua. I think, first of all, Joshua was the one who led the army in the battle when Moses was standing up on top of the mountain, and you remember Aaron and Hur had to come alongside of Moses and help him keep his hands up in the air so that the battle could be won. It's pretty courageous to go out in the battlefield and lead men into war. Joshua was the one who came back and go, oh, man, this land is everything God said it would be. But there are giants in the land, and there are fortified cities, but God will fight with us. You know, Joshua was saying, hey, look, those giants are big, but they're just too big to miss. Just fire at them, get them. That's my paraphrase on what Joshua said, by the way. <laughs> but, but, but Joshua seems to, and all of those things, to be a strong and a courageous individual. I see Joshua, Joshua as having great courage. In, uh, I think it's the book of Numbers, when God is introducing Joshua to everybody, he, he says, I'm, I'm going, I'm dying, but I want to introduce you to Joshua. And, and he said to Joshua, be strong and courageous. I wonder if Joshua was like, look, my whole life I've been strong and courageous. Now you're telling me to be strong and courageous. And then God sees him here, and, and it's his call. It's his, it's his anointing. It, it, he's, being, he, he's, given, he's being given this job, and God says, be strong and courageous. Joshua's like, is there something I don't know? Because I thought I was a strong guy. I thought I was a courageous guy. But listen, courage is, courage is rare, but courage is the willingness to say, I'm gonna do what's tough. I'm gonna walk into to where, where I may have a cost, and I'm gonna be courageous. God's looking for courageous souls, and God's looking for strong souls. You say, well, I'm weak, I'm, I'm weak, I'm, I'm weak. I just can't do much for God. I don't know, you're, you're strong. You've got the Holy Spirit in you. You're possessed. <laughs> Not by a devil. You're possessed by the spirit of the living God. Terry in Jerusalem, Acts 1, 8, and you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the, the uttermost parts of the world. And I gotta think Vancouver qualifies as the uttermost parts of the world from Judea and Samaria. The promise is for you, the promise is for me, the promise is for all of us, but I've got a question for you today. This is the motivational speaker thing here. Are you strong? Uh, Christian, are you tired? Are you weary? Are you weak? Have you tried things that didn't work and you're just feeling like I just, you know, I'm just weak and I just, hey, step up and be strong. 
Know that we trust in a God who can do anything that, that, that he's called us to do. Look for where you can be involved. Get plugged in. Do it. Start fighting in the battle. Be strong and be courageous. And if you are strong and courageous today, and this is God's word to you, don't be like I think Joshua was. What? What? I've proven myself over and over again to be strong and courageous. Hey, just take it and be even more strong and be even more courageous. But it doesn't end there. The next thing that he says to him is be strong and very courageous. Look at it here, verse seven. Only be strong and very courageous. He's added a very to the courageous. Be strong and courageous. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand, to the left hand, that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, and you shall observe to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. Here's the, here's the next statement. Only be good and be very courageous to do all that is written in the law and all the commandments of God. Are you strong enough to keep God's word? Are you strong enough to do what God says? It's been my experience that faith is rare. It's been my experience that Christians that say, I'm gonna live the word of God is rare. There, there are some reasons for that. Part of it is, is that we've had people, you know, you need to, in order to, to live this, at least today, and the title of the message is Reaching Your Potential in Christ Today, okay? So if you're gonna, if you're gonna live this today, you gotta boil down what the law and the prophets are. You gotta boil it all down. And there are all kinds of people that boil God's word down in a wrong way. They tell us what it is, but in the end, they're evangelical Pharisees. They have, a bunch, they have a bunch of rules. They have a bunch of lists. They have what you can and cannot do. If you listen to that music, you don't really love God. You, 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 know, you, you, do this, you do this thing, you better do what I'm telling you you ought to do. Or, or, and they're just like the Pharisees for Jesus. Jesus said, you lay heavy burdens on men's back, but you yourself are not willing to lift them up, not even with one of your fingers. After the service, somebody goes outside and lights up a cigarette. You're driving out of here, and you see the guy light up the cigarette. You go, see that, Martha? I just figure there gotta be a lot of Marthas in Vancouver, I don't know. <laughs> you see that? You see that, Martha? Guy's smoking. Gotta be a carnal Christian. <laughs> smoking outside of a church. But here's the thing. You have no idea what God has done in that man's life. You have no idea how God has set him free Maybe God set him free from heroin two weeks ago. And to God, the cigarette's nothing. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying, you know, the Bible never says, don't smoke up tobacco leaves and suck them into your lungs. But I don't know that it has to. I'm not saying it's a good thing to do. I'm just saying we've become, we've made our rules. We, we're talking about what spiritual is. And it might be that that guy and Martha, his wife, that what they did in judging him was a lack of love and that what God cared about greater was the fact that he, that they didn't love that guy. That they didn't say, let's, let's look for him in church. Let's go hug him. Let's go get to know him. Let's love him. Let's find out what's going on inside of his life. When you boil down all of the scriptures, what does it say? What does it say in Romans? What does it say in Galatians? It says that in this, all of the law and all of the prophets is fulfilled that you love your neighbor, that you love God. Jesus, a lawyer came to Jesus and asked him a question, and this is a question a lawyer would ask. Only a lawyer would ask this. What are the greatest two laws? Jesus says the greatest law is this that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second is like it, that you love your neighbor as yourself. 
See, it's all boiled down. You don't need to know nothing else. You could be a brand new Christian here today. You could have just met the Lord a few weeks ago, and you know what God has required of you, that you love Him and you love people, and then you will never be an evangelical Pharisee. You'll never make your rules and lay your trip on people, man. I was a child of the, I was a teenager of the 70s, so whenever I say the word trip, I got to throw a man in there after that. So I'll say it again. You're going to never lay your trip on people, man. You're going to love them. You're going to care about them. Because you love God, then your life is going to be directed by things that love God, not pharisaical things. And you're going to love people. Are you strong enough? And are you courageous enough? Can this be a word from God to you today? Only be strong and be very courageous to do all that is written in the law and all that is in, in the prophets, that everything that God has given. Are you strong enough? Are you courageous enough? Are you? I'm asking you, are you strong enough? Are you courageous enough to actually do God's word? To say, Lord, you show me and I'll do it. I want to know. I don't want to say it's easy because loving people sometimes ain't easy. Loving people sometimes, sometimes people make it pretty hard to love them. But the man with the withered hand, when Jesus said, reach out your, you reach out your hand, he didn't say, hey, listen, buddy, I'm going to heal you. So when I tell you to reach out your hand, he didn't say that. He just said, reach out your hand. The guy with the withered hand could have said, I can't, it's withered. But as he did it, as the command came, he suddenly had the power to reach out his hand. And when Jesus says, a new commandment that I give unto you, that you love one another, in that command is the power to love one another, to love even the unlovable. And I want to remind you, Jesus said, you got a heavy burden? Then lay that burden on me because, because, because my, my burden is easy. My burden is light. We're not talking about, you know, I better learn those rules. I better follow the rules right. I better learn what those evangelical you know, rules are to find out what, just love people. You can never go wrong. What does love tell you to do? I've often said, I would rather do the wrong thing with a motive of love than do the right thing with some other motive. Because love covers a multitude of sins. Because if I, if I do something wrong to you, but you know I love you, and you know I did it because I love you, then you're going to receive my sorry a whole lot easier, aren't you? I'm sorry. I, I, I wanted to do what was right there. I'm, I'm sorry. I love you. Love is, love is so powerful. This is what the Scriptures boil down to, right? That's what we're talking about. We're talking about fulfilling the Scriptures, loving God and loving people. Love is so powerful that it's, it's what I call one of the greatest keys to evangelism. Because when people walk in the church, they will know that you are His disciples, by the love that you have for one another. When they see you loving each other, getting to know one another, being there for one another, bearing one another's burdens, when they see that in the church, they'll know the world doesn't have nothing like it because no, there's no bar, no matter how chummy or, 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 or how they sway together in their songs, there's no, there's no concert in the world that can relate in any way to the worship that they have. They can light their lighters or put up their cell phones with their lights on and sing, Hey Jude, all they want, and wave their lighters around. But it is nothing compared to what we have when we express the love of God in worship and begin to experience together what God is all about. Love one another. Be there one another. May God knit your hearts together. May people see the love that you have for each other and they will know that you are His disciples disciples. One more thing, and it's not, it's in closing, but it's not, it's not small. One more thing, at the end of that passage, and I've already read it, it says, be careful to observe those things that you have been commanded. And then he says to meditate on it day and night, to observe and do according to all that is written on them, that you will make your way prosperous and that you will have good success. Isn't it interesting that meditating on the Word of God in Joshua chapter 1 is connected to prosperity and good success? And in, in Psalms 1, meditate on the Word of God day and night, and you will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, and you will bring forth your fruit in its season, and whatever you do will prosper. 
Isn't that interesting? And now I need to just say here at the end of this study, we're, we're not talking about faith movement prospering here. We're not reducing the incredible, awesome richness of Christ to money and mammon. It's the love of money that produces all kinds of evil. We're talking about real prosperity. Paul said if the, in, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, if there's anybody among you teaching godliness as a means of financial gain, withdraw yourself from them. Get away from them. But then he said this, but godliness with contentment is great gain. When you are content where God's placed you, we're talking about prosperity in your life. We're talking about you being able to fulfill what God's called you to do, prospering in the riches of Christ, in the riches of the kingdom that go on forever and ever. When Paul was taking an offering, he said, I don't, I don't, want, your, I don't want your money. I love that. I don't want your money, I want you, he said. And I want the fruit that will abound to your account. Paul cared that when they got to heaven, there would be fruit that would abound towards their account. That's prospering. In this world, we're being consumed day by day. We are on the altar. We are living sacrifices. The smoke, the aroma is going up before God, and He is well pleased as we sacrifice our lives for Him. But we are gaining real success here and now and real prosperity for the future. The success that we have cannot be equated to this world. And what a silly thing that people do that. Take something as shallow, something as evil as fame and success now and compare it to the heavenly success that each one of us have been promised. And again, folks, God doesn't treat everybody the same. It's all on a scale. You don't got to go out and be a Billy Graham to receive Billy Graham's rewards or Billy Graham size rewards. In fact, I've heard it argued that if you will just be faithful with what God's called you to do and gifted you to do, that you'll receive more rewards than Billy Graham because Billy Graham got all this fame right here and now. People drop his name. I was talking to Billy Graham the other day. Ooh, you were talking to Billy Graham. I like to respond. I have a couple friends who know Billy Graham, by the way. Every once in a while they tell me, I was at the Cove talking to Billy Graham. And I always like to respond, I was in my house talking to Jesus Christ the other day. <laughs> you might know Billy Graham, but I know the King of Kings and I know the Lord of Lords. And you will receive success and you will be prosperous. And tell me, tell me, tell me which one of us doesn't want that? Which one of us doesn't want our lives to be successful? Which one of us doesn't want that grand entrance into heaven where we receive whatever rewards? And I love in the book of Revelation, they throw the crowns back at his feet. We see Jesus and like Abraham, God said, said I am your exceedingly great reward that we will see him and know him and be blown away by him. And we will say, what a tremendous reward. And that our call here is welcoming friends to the kingdom of heaven. Greeted by friends. And the Bible says that? That says, says, use your mammon of this world to make friends for the kingdom of heaven. That when we get up there, there'll be people. And see, and, and the whole thing is too, you might think, well, I, I don't know. You know, you, you hear Bill Bright's thing, 95% of people never let anybody, 95% of Christians never let anybody to Christ. And so you think only 5% do? Yeah, but that's, that's not really fair because some are called to water and some are called to plant and some are called to harvest. And don't think God doesn't forget the labor of those who plant seeds and those who water. You may spend your whole life sowing seeds and watering and never in the harvest at all. And you, my friend, will reap the rewards. You will rejoice together as we stand in that group of people in a number that cannot be numbered from every tribe and every language all around the world. And we will exalt the name of the Lamb who sits on the throne and what a glorious time it will be. And every day that passes without us being strong and courageous, fades away without time. I was calculating decades here recently, probably because I'm getting a little older. 
looking at life like decades. How many more decades do I got? There's only about 4,000 days and 4,000 something days in a decade. It kind of boils it down, doesn't it? Doesn't seem like very many, does it? Decade, long time. How, how are you going to use those, those days? I'm not telling you, knuckle down, buckle down, do it, do it, do it. I'm telling you, love God. Love people. Take advantage of those days because they're, they're fading away. Redeem the time, Paul said, because it is short. Pray with me, would you? Father, we're so blessed by this passage. We are truly.